Well, I think, I mean, I've been interested in oil for some time, you know, and we had the, we had the project outlined and we figured out where we we're going to go. And we, we knew that it was going to be about, um, you know, oil depletion and then depletion of other resources and also what are the alternatives. If, if we know that the status quo doesn't work, where are we going, you know? So I had a very abstract sense of what I was doing, um, but I hadn't yet kind of felt it. You know, and I'd, I'd been listening to people talk about depletion, for example, how fields rise and fall, and the sort of the technical aspect of it. But again, it was abstract, you know, and it was sort of like I think the typical journalist's uh, disease, which is you don't ever believe anything you're writing, you know. It, I mean, you couldn't. It's all just, you know, you're just you're a fiction writer. You just don't call yourself a fiction writer. It happens to be true what you're writing, but you haven't quite bought it yet. And you've, because you're, you, you maintain this journalistic distance from your topic, as you should. And I'm standing out there in the middle of the desert with the Saudis, and the guys finally said, you know, they're, um, they told me that the world's biggest oil field, you know, was, was filling up with water. And, and it was just to have them say that. It just struck me. I just remember I was just standing there in the desert, beautiful. It was a beautiful evening, you know. The sun's gone down. The sky is that dark blue. The sand is red. It's, in the, it's like a, you know, it's like out of a movie. You're sitting there, and it's perfect, and they're talking about an oil field. We're visiting a field called Sheba, which they're quite proud of. It's a brand-new field they just started producing from. And Gowar, the big oil field, the world's biggest, is, uh, you know, in some ways away. And I just, uh, we've been talking about Sheba, and I just asked them casually about Gowar, and they, they uh, you know, from a kind of a competitive sense, these engineers, they said, oh, he's, he's asking about Gowar again. They were really kind of disappointed because they, you know, they're tired of answering questions about Gowar, and they just, they were, they were feeling kind of catty, and they said, oh, Gowar, you know, um, it's filling with water, and they're just kind of like, oops, you know, and they said it, the water cut was 30%, right, that, which meant 30% of the fluids coming out are water, and there was this moment of silence, and I think, you know, it wasn't like a state secret, but I think they're going, well, we probably shouldn't have said that, but meanwhile, I was thinking to my, I got this chill that ran through my body, the hairs actually went up on the back of my neck, because it was the first time that someone had said, you know, and just for, for, the, for, the, for a second, I thought, wow, what if this is all true? You know, what if this isn't just kind of end of the world fanatics who need to have something to feel bad about so they're, they're looking at oil depletion? What if it's actually, you know, truly going to happen and it's going to happen in my lifetime? And all of a sudden everything else kind of falls in place. You're, you're, you're thinking, wow, so if that's going to happen, what does that mean? Um, not just to my lifestyle, but, you know, what about to, you know, um, the economic growth of my country that I happen to live in? What about, in, you know, in Europe and elsewhere? What about countries, you know, like Africa or China? You start adding it all up. And it, it suddenly becomes quite serious. It's so easy to go into denial about peak oil because it, it, it changes everything. Every one of us has grown up during this unique historical period when we've had easy access to, to cheap energy and all of the things that cheap energy can do for us. And so even people who, who intellectually understand peak oil, as soon as they turn their attention away, almost immediately start to go into sort of their normal mode of thinking. It's a natural human response. I find myself doing it all the time. And, you know, I, I spend hours every day studying peak oil from all sorts of different standpoints. As soon as I turn my attention away, suddenly I'm in the normal world again, this, the so-called normal world, the, the consensus trance that we all live in on a daily basis. In the rich world, in the industrial world, in the English-speaking world, I see almost zero likelihood that the majority is going to actively embrace this anytime soon. But, nonetheless, because of the geological imperative of this, something or other will happen, whether people like it or not. We are almost 
absolutely totally dependent on oil for all of our activities. First of all, industry, of course, runs on oil. Everyone understands that. Agriculture, modern mechanised agriculture to feed the world uh, is heavily dependent on oil. Uh, if you look at transportation, uh, again, it's obvious cars and planes uh, run on oil, petroleum, gasoline. Uh, and of course military capability. You cannot fight a war, as the Americans know, without oil. Uh, so every aspect of human existence uh, is dependent on oil and when we reach that point, when we get to maximum production, uh, maximum supply capacity relative to demand, uh, that is a very significant point which uh, many people think, including me, is without precedent in human history. Global oil production will peak. The global economy will be devastated by it. We'll see oil wars. Everything will change as a consequence. And yet people won't be talking about the oil peak. They'll talking, be talking about the unemployment figures. They'll be talking about the high price of food. They'll be talking about the fact that you can't get on an airliner and, and travel anymore because all of the airline industry has, has collapsed. There are only a few carriers still in business and the tickets are astronomically expensive. They'll be talking about the latest uh, war or terrorist incident. And they will have completely lost sight of the one event that caused all of those effects. I think the, the evidence for peak oil is absolutely overwhelming. Uh, first of all, we're discovering uh, less and less new oil fields. Um, virtually four-fifths of the oil that we're now consuming comes from fields discovered before 1970. The opportunity uh, to find new oil uh, becomes limited to smaller and smaller pockets which are more difficult to extract and more costly. We are now consuming each year three times more than the oil, extra oil that we're discovering and that gap is, is widening. Uh, but the key point is, I think, really this. At the moment, the world is using about 84 million barrels a day. Uh, opinion in the oil industry is uh, that we could perhaps, at an absolute limit, push that to around 95 million barrels a day. I don't think you'll find anyone in the oil industry itself, let alone outside it, who thinks we could do better than that. There's something like 53 countries now are physically producing less today than they have at some point in the, in the historical past. I mean, that's fact. That's not interpretation or anything. Of course, you could, if it's just reached peak, you say, may say that's an anomaly, it may, may be able to do a little bit better next year. But by and large, most countries are either past peak or going over it. Britain, for example, peaked in 1999. Norway has also now gone over the top, as the Norwegian government uh, uh, confirms. And, and it's falling fast, about 6% a year. So that means the, the world is pretty much close to peak of ordinary conventional oil, then there's another surge of this deep water oil, the last frontier, so to speak. There's a little surge of that coming in probably. And then, of course, there's the heavy oils of Canada and Venezuela that come in as a huge resource. There's no shortage of it, but the extraction rate is extremely slow and, and expensive. So if you put the whole thing together, I think we have a peak around 210. I think the general consensus probably within the oil industry itself, although they're very unwilling to say this publicly, but the academic uh, researchers who are much more likely to be independent and hard-headed in their analysis outside the oil industry believe that peak oil probably in the area of a 2010, 2015, something like that. And after that, uh, we begin to see a gradual, very slow, gradual reduction in the supply, but an acceleration of demand. Um, that's why uh, this is not alarmist. Uh, it is impossible to believe that that will not happen. It is going to happen. Also, there's so much debate about this data peak. It really misses the point to a degree because 
Whether the peak came last year, this year, or in 10 years' time doesn't really make that much difference because it's not a high peak, it's only the maximum, a rather gentle curve. And the real impact of all of that, which is beginning to be realised, is not the peak itself, but the vision of the long decline that follows peak. And that's a relentless, remorseless decline that goes on forever at 2 or 3% a year. It's not individually very much but that eats into our, 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 our supply very seriously and, and ever worse. We expend about 10 calories of fossil fuel energy for every calorie of food energy that we produce. Now this would have been impossible in any earlier historical time before we had access to cheap oil. If, if we had been uh, expending more energy to grow food in the medieval era, than the food gave us, we would starve. It's only because of this, this one time only gift from nature of fossil fuels that were created over millions of years and stored up and that we have been drawing down over the course of just a couple of hundred years that we're able to run these energy deficits in our food system. So we're enormously exposed in that area and, uh, and, and peak oil could in fact mean uh, widespread hunger and even famine on a global scale if we don't prepare for it and begin to transform our global food system to one that is not so dependent on fossil fuels. So I think it's a great illusion for people to think, oh yes, we've been through this, we faced it in the 1970s and we got out of it. Uh, we sort of got out of it. You could argue that we made a right mess of getting out of it and got ourselves into a much worse fix and we should have listened to some of the signals from the earth and so forth, but we clearly didn't. This time it's going to be different and I think that's going to be rather a stark realisation for people and I think people for a long time are going to be thinking, oh, we got out of the 1930s, we got out of the 1970s, what's going wrong? Why can't we get out of it now using the same kind of techniques? And I think using the same kind of techniques, at least some of the similar techniques, would be a great mistake, although I've no doubt that's what's going to be tried, unfortunately. <laughs>
And when that happens, money effectively starts to disappear from the economy. The decline itself is not really a serious uh, crisis, but as the financial community wakes up that the growth is no longer possible, and this decline has not only started, but it's going on, it's not just a little downturn, it's a beginning of a new a age, that this could cause quite a shock. I mean, it could cause resource wars for people to try and get access to what is left, could, I think personally it probably heralds the second Great Depression that somehow they've got to wipe out just mountains of capital. Irrespective of the, of the peak itself, I think there'll be such a gap between the, uh, the available supply and the desire, if you like, the, 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 the demand, that it'll, always, it'll already cause huge trouble. Now that may coincide with the peak and that may not. So that will be a, a very interesting period of time to look at in terms of public reaction. And I mean, once you start seeing gas lines, once you see um, petrol stations, gasoline stations um, running out of gasoline, once you start seeing trucks on American roads and on European roads just broken down and run out of, of, of diesel on the side of the road, not having made their deliveries, supermarket shelves going empty. Once you start seeing that kind of thing, it's going to be very, very difficult for opinion leaders, for the media, for politicians, for uh, corporate executives. It's going to be very difficult for them to spin a tale which explains that um, without actually admitting that, that actually the reason is that we're, we're at peak oil and we're facing decline. <laughs>
you know, that's that's something they need to know about beforehand. That's something they, they need to prepare for. And peak oil is the event of our lifetimes. It's going to dwarf anything that any of us has experienced in our, our lives up to this point. And yet we're told virtually nothing about it. Uh, same thing with 9-11. I mean, here, here was the great political event, so-called terrorist event of our lifetimes. The world has changed profoundly as a result of it. And yet there's absolutely no real investigative reporting about it in the mainstream media. Uh, instead, we have a, a, a lot of very courageous, independent investigative journalists who find it impossible to get their, their work published in the mainstream. It's a disastrous situation. I personally believe that there is a, a deep relationship between uh, the events of 9-11 and peak oil, but it's not something I can prove. Um, there's a lot of circumstantial uh, uh, bits and pieces that, that, when you add them up together, paint a pretty persuasive picture, I think. The CIA has been, been uh, studying the phenomenon of oil peaks since the 1970s. And uh, Dick Cheney, former CEO of Halliburton, the world's uh, foremost oil services company, has, has talked about uh, the, the, the difficulty that the oil industry will have in meeting demand by the end of, of the first decade of the, of the 21st century. Now, what happened uh, uh, after 9-11? Well, of course, the U.S. invaded Afghanistan and used that occasion to build military bases throughout the region of Central Asia, which is... The, the, the new oil production region, lots of, lots of new uh, oil discoveries there in, coincidentally, 2000 to 2001. And then to invade Iraq, uh, one can't help but see a pattern here. It, it, it seems evident to me that 9-11 uh, that was in effect a, a, a kind of pretext for the U.S. to expand its military hold on the two most important oil-producing regions of the planet. There are a number of elites, a number of, of very influential policy advisors, a lot, a lot of people who went on to form part of the administration knew that peak oil was coming. They knew that they would not be able to survive peak oil without um, without having this massive militarization of policy, and thirdly, that they needed to do that on the back of a, of a drastic uh, attack or perception of a threat on an in, in invasion to the United States, and this is what 9-11 provided. In our work, the fundamental uh, job that we do for people is in understanding what's really going on and trying to understand what is behind events and what is motivating people. That's different from passing judgment on it. We're not trying to make value judgments. Uh, we try to eschew value judgments as much as possible, as a matter of fact, in, in, our, in our consulting work. We are very interested in what really happened on 911, is the short answer. Well, you have uh, four options uh, to declare 9-11. Uh, uh, one is it was a strike out of, the blue, out of the blue, nobody knew anything. It was the first version the American administration told the public. Uh, then uh, they knew a lot, uh, but in different agencies, and the picture was uh, was so so difficult to put together that they couldn't find out what was happening, what was uh, in the future. Uh, and uh, I think it's break uh, has broken down, but the, the administration is fighting on this line. Uh, the third option is they let it happen. They knew something, or they, they knew the whole story and let it happen because they could use it in order to bring about war against up to 60 states, as they said later on. Um, and the, 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 third, the fourth uh, version is they, they organized it or were part of organizing it.
and the the way uh, it it happened um, is is so strange, and the unwillingness of the administration to clear up all the environment uh, is so strong. Um, uh, that I finally come to the to the belief that it must be a steered operation, covered operation. Yeah. When I started looking through the 9/11 Commission report, I was I was outraged. Uh, I mean, here was a, a book that had shot to the top of the bestseller lists, and Americans, millions of Americans, were looking to this this report, this book, to tell them what actually happened on September 11th, 2001. And they were doing so under the assumption that there had been a clear, open inquiry into the events, that all of the relevant questions had been asked and evidence had been provided. And this clearly was not the case. Well, the, the Keene report um, on 9-11, which was uh, finally set up, uh, I think is not a serious examination of what happened and what the causes were. I say that uh, first of all because uh, clearly the Bush administration didn't want to do it. They resisted all the calls um, for an official inquiry for several months and what actually finally persuaded them to do this was not the politicians in Congress, it was uh, the families, the wives, of those who were killed at 9-11. The first thing it does is, is name the, uh, the 19 hijackers, the mostly uh, Saudi nationals. Uh, but of course we, we heard within days of, of the events that something like five or six of these people were still alive and well and living in the Middle East. Why wasn't this addressed in the 9-11 uh, Commission report? Why weren't uh, you know, why, why wasn't there some inquiry as to who were the real hijackers if, in fact, the people who had been identified were clearly not the right people? And on the day itself, <clears throat> which I think is the most significant evidence, the first plane hit at uh, 8.46 a.m., the uh, Southern Tower at uh, about 9.05 a.m., uh, the third plane hit the Pentagon at 9.38 a.m., they knew there was a hijack um, between 8.10 and 8.20 in the morning, let's say 8.15, so they knew half an hour before the first plane, three quarters of an hour before the second plane, and an hour and a half before the third plane hit their targets. And not once in that time did they scramble a warplane to intercept. Now that is just staggering when first of all they had Andrews Air Base, which is 10 miles west of Washington, uh, with F-16s with a top speed of 1500 miles an hour, they could have been over the scene within a minute or two. Why were none of them scrambled? Uh, and uh, secondly, you might think, well, there was chaos, no one knew what to do, it was a catastrophe, but, just standard operating procedure. When a plane is off course, fighter jets are notified. Fighter jets go out to see if the plane's having a problem or just, well, what the problem is, because the plane's obviously off course. And for the year before 9-11-01, fighter jets were called out on 67 occasions. So the question is, when we knew, we knew of at least four planes were off course, and there's words that it was even up to 11. But where were the fighter jets? They weren't there. Now, from our research, which people wouldn't know, we have now found out that there were 15 exercises going on that day involving all the fighter jets in the northeastern portion of the United States. What are the odds of that occurring? Like zero? I mean, or, you know, 100%, I, guess, I mean, 100% they couldn't occur without a fix being in. Why had these, these towers fallen so quickly, these steel frame towers? 
no steel framed um, buildings had ever collapsed before because of fire, why wasn't there a proper inquiry? I think something like $600,000 was spent to investigate why the Twin Towers collapsed. Meanwhile, something like $52 million were spent to investigate whether Bill Clinton had had an affair. This is absurd. There's been many fires in many buildings before and even after. And I think uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where I'm from, right outside of Philadelphia, there was the Meridian building fire and smoke throughout the building. Several firemen were killed in that fire. Building didn't fall down. Buildings don't fall down, never did before, never did after. A prime example is what occurred in uh, February of 2005. A 45, 50 story building in Madrid, Spain burned out of control, wildfires. It was on all the TV shows and networks. The building was totally gutted, still stood afterwards, still stood there. Taking it down, I, I witnessed it myself. They're taking it down now, steel beam by steel beam. Concrete and steel buildings do not fall down from fires. I know it's hard for people to believe, but it's our position that they came down because they were imploded or explosives occurred. Fact is, building number seven, across the street from the North and South Tower, had some fires in it, but no plane hit it. At 5.20 in the afternoon, the owner of the building, Larry Silverstein, receives a phone call from the fire department saying they can't put out the fire. So he said, pull the building. Pull the building means implode the building. I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull, and then we watched the building collapse. And it came down in its own footprint. That's significant because the North and South Tower also came down in their own footprint. That's also significant because the remnants of Building 7 were, was pulverized material. The remnants of the North and South Tower was pulverized material. In the basement of Building 7, they found molten steel at 1,500 degrees. In the basement of the North and South Tower, they found molten steel at 1,500 degrees. You know, one and one still equal two as far as I'm concerned. And that's a fact that people can take a look at. When thermite is used to cut steel, it leaves behind molten iron. And two scientists, uh, engineers who were at the World Trade Center in the weeks after 9-11, reported seeing massive amounts of molten iron. And I found out that there was uh, pools of molten steel found in the basement of the World Trade Center when they finally scraped down to that level. So that indicates that, that temperatures of a very high degree were reached through the use of thermite. Now what happened is that the steel was taken and uh, the federal government oversaw this. There were four companies involved in the cleanup. They took the steel to a, a dump on Staten Island, and then it was promptly cut up and sent to places like Korea, China, and India, where it was promptly melted down. This is the largest destruction of evidence from a crime scene in history. I don't know how many, uh, how many uh, people within governments have second thoughts. I think the Secret Services know quite well and they, they have the professionals uh, finding out that, uh, that this can't happen like the American uh, administration is telling the public. Uh, there are, there are um, experts around uh, uh, which would agree with, uh, with dissent. Uh, but to put it up and uh, to bring it into the, the operational level for uh, governments, uh, it's very difficult because because uh, the, the 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 American administration administration is fighting like hell against anybody who is doubting about their version of things. One can see that the, the story just being massaged to uh, to where it's um, consistent with itself, not necessarily consistent with the facts or with previous testimony, but but so that it's internally consistent so that it becomes the new myth that uh, Americans and the rest of the people around the world presumably believe about 9-11. In fact, we still do not know what happened that day. We don't know who was behind it. Um, 
and that has enormous implications for our understanding of what's going on in the world today. The use of conspiracy theory as a derogatory, uh, as an epithet almost, is something that propagandists have perfected over the decades. And, and it's a useful tool for, for eliminating articulate dissent and other points of view and information that might be inconvenient for a policy agenda. I think it's very much part of the political culture to, um, to kind of, to, it's ingrained in us that this kind of, the idea that our leaders could ever commit atrocities against our own civilians is so morally horrible, horrifying, we just can't believe it. Um, and I think that this is, this, this really goes back to the way our culture has developed over the years, the idea that we are, Western civilization has ingrained in its certain moral categories that prevent us from doing any certain kinds of acts. People don't want to believe it occurred, but we have to go back in history. People in Germany didn't believe what was taking place in the 1930s and 1940s. Jewish people did not believe what was taking place uh, throughout the uh, Europe. Uh, people in the United States didn't want to accept what was taking place back then. So we should look back in history and realize that events like this have taken place and we better put up our safeguards now before it's too late. A lot of the people in the anti-war movement want nothing to do with 9-11. Well, ladies and gentlemen, wake up. If you didn't have 9-11, you wouldn't have the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. I think the, the main aim uh, of the Bush administration is uh, uh, broken down or written down in the project of a new American century. To um, They say we have to fight against at least 60 states harboring uh, terror, terrorism, um, uh, mostly in the near, near where, where oil uh, is situated or gas. Um, and uh, in order to bring uh, the, the, the support for this war, uh, it is necessary to have this international new terrorism. Most of the planning for the war on terror preceded 9-11. And you can really see the extent to which there was a desperation on the part of government leaders in the West, not just in the United States, as regards the impending crisis posed by peak oil. There are a number of studies which show that they have been aware of the peak oil crisis for a while. So the idea was that American foreign policy would be reinvigorated with energy policy and the two would be combined. And it mentions the Middle East, it mentions the Persian Gulf, and it mentions Iraq. Uh, this is very much a, this is very much, not so much a war of, of against terrorism, it's, it's a war to secure control over distribution. And in that sense, it is absolutely no different whatsoever than the Rockefellers' uh, move to control the North American oil industry in the late 19th century, which was not so much a move to control the pumping of oil, and the extraction of oil. Rockefeller's genius was in seeing that if you could control distribution, you could control the industry. And the same is true today, extrapolated through the the, the, the global market. And the advantage of an American uh, takeover of uh, Iraq is that you get immediately physical control of the second largest deposit of oil that is left. Secondly, you are on the doorstep if anything happens uh, in Saudi. And by having uh, American bases, um, which are already exist, of course, in Saudi and in Kuwait, and if we now have a string of American bases, which is what I think will happen in Iraq, um, you then have control of the Middle East. But that is what it is really all about. Um, and I think the Americans, in order to do this, in order to extend their power, uh, in order to explain to the world um, something which is more acceptable and that the Americans want to control the rest of the oil that is left, they needed a, some kind of facade, some kind of explanation, some kind of rationale. And for that, uh, the enemy after the fall of uh, Soviet Russia with the collapse of the Berlin Wall in 1989, they needed a new enemy and very conveniently the Islamic threat became uh, that new enemy. But the question we have to ask is stepping back how far have those people uh, either been funded or trained by the CIA and MI6 in the past or, or even now? And how far the actions 
of the British and the Americans in the Middle East have created the circumstances in which people would become involved in those organizations. It's a clash of, uh, it's, it's a clash of uh, civilization. Uh, this is the theme which was, has been brought up in the beginning of the 90s. Sam Huntington told us we have to have new enemies. We have, uh, otherwise Western, Western societies will not be able to lead. So um, you see this, uh, this idea behind all this. I don't believe in Osama bin Laden, I don't believe in Al-Qaeda. I think it's all brought up by continuous uh, faking of, of intelligence and propaganda. So the notion of a U.S. war on terrorism is simply a fraud. There is no war on terrorism. The Anglo-Americans are backing terrorists exactly when and where it suits them, from Chechenia to, to Cuba to other points around the world. The bulk of my research in my book, The War on Truth, concerns the role of Al-Qaeda as an instrument of Western covert operations. And this really does, for me, fundamentally undermine the entire concept of the war on terror, the entire view that they've given us of 9-11 and what happened. Because if Al-Qaeda is an instrument of covert operations rather than an enemy of the West, then there is no war on terror. And this is really the crux of the issue. This is a typical British strategy. You've got to know the name of Brigadier General Sir Frank Kitson. He was the British operations officer in Kenya at the time of the Mau Mau. And what, what Kitson saw, which has been known to commanders for, for centuries, millennia, if you've got an underground nationalist organization and you want to discredit them, you create your own parallel underground nationalist organization. You send them out. It's got to have the same name. It's got to have a false flag. You send them out, have it commit tremendous atrocities. Those will be blamed on the original relatively benign group, and they'll be discredited, they'll be demonized, and you gain political advantage. He wrote a book about it called Low Intensity Operations. And these, the technique is called the technique of the counter gang or the pseudo gang. Just as Al Qaeda, in the broader sense, is a pseudo gang or counter gang created by US and British and Israeli intelligence, it's a counter gang against normal Arab nationalists or anybody with any positive agenda for reform or independence or development anywhere in the Arab world. They can always be labeled Al-Qaeda. The, the, the reductio ad absurdum of this is President Chavez of Venezuela, after giving Bush a hard time at various conferences and doing things to undermine the dollar, the neocons are now accusing President Chavez of being a member of Al-Qaeda. So you can see how easy it is to demonize somebody once you've got a good counter gang going. It's now been documented beyond a doubt, based on historical records, um, that the CIA, the MI6, teamed up with very, very secretive parallel elements of, of European intelligence services and orchestrated terrorist attacks to mobilize the public against the left, against the communists, and so on and so forth. Um, and this would be really shocking to people if they knew that this is what happened. And this is what happened. There's no doubt about it. I mean, the best book on it is, is um, Daniel Ganser's book, NATO's Secret Armies. So this is serious academic stuff. There's an oligarchical consensus in the United States, inspired by the neocons, inspired by Samuel Huntington and the rest of them, which is that without an enemy image, you cannot have an oligarchical society. Ultimately, that's the why, because if you look at this, you say terrorism, endless war, why, who benefits? Those who benefit are the beneficiaries of the current system, financiers primarily. Uh, they feel that without the diversion of a war, they cannot maintain social relations, property relations in the current form, and this they are determined to do. So they have manufactured in a complete hysteria, a, com a largely fictitious external enemy. You remember 1984 by George Orwell. Julia at one point says, I don't even think there is a war. It's just a fake to keep people under control. Orwell, I think, had a very good understanding of some of these psychological uh, mechanisms. It's absolutely clear to me that a conscious decision has been made by the highest elements of our governments to allow and proliferate a terrorist threat. And this justifies the the, the, the absolute wholesale militarization of policy 
not just in terms of foreign policy, but at home in the crushing of civil liberties, the criminalization of dissent, you know, the introduction of draconian terrorist legislation, which only allows them, allows governments to have even more powers uh, against, against free speech and against, um, against uh, public mobilization. So this, this, whole, this is really the function that Al-Qaeda plays. It plays a fundamentally functional role in a, in, in, in a myriad of ways, fueling covert operations, securing um, oil and gas interests quite directly, and indirectly generating the justification and the ideological framework necessary to legitimize um, this, the, 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 this, this whole insanely repressive structure of, of violence that we have today called the war on terror, which is really just a, a gigantic lie. This has been fabricated for this purpose. When the economic impacts of peak oil take hold, uh, there's going to be very high unemployment. Uh, and when countries descend in the, into that kind of, of economic turmoil, there is social unrest almost always as a consequence. I mean, look back to the 1930s. Um, there was real concern throughout corporate America that the United States might fall to a, a, um, a communist government. Um, now, I think in, in the U.S., following peak oil, there likewise will probably be considerable social unrest. And I think the Patriot Act is, is a way of preemptively dealing with that, that unrest. This is a pattern that goes back many, many, many decades. And the involvement of military intelligence, uh, the involvement of the CIA in, in these organizations in the, in, within the borders of the United States is something that has, is, is amply documented in scholarly work and you don't have to be a radical to observe it. The U.S. leaders are putting in place a, an infrastructure whereby they will be able to deal with that unrest and at the same time channel it towards scapegoats on the other side of the world. We'll, I'm sure that we'll be told that uh, the reason we don't have enough oil is that uh, there are evil people somewhere who are keeping it from us, who are, have uh, perhaps a, a attacked uh, oil rigs or, or sunk tankers or battleships in, in the Persian Gulf or something like that. And therefore, you know, we, we just have to go over there and, and deal with that problem. And once we've done that, of course, uh, the American way of life can, can continue as it was before. Of course, that's a lie. The, the American way of life is, is effectively finished. It can't continue past the time of peak oil. Everything must change to adapt to the reality of a much lower energy world. But that's not the, the kind of message that Americans are going to want to hear. And so I, I, I think that um, there's a very high possibility of the United States becoming a, a kind of uh, fascistic sort of regime. Uh, and I, I desperately hate to see that happen. But uh, if, if one just looks at, at, the, uh, at, the, at the signs on the horizon, they all point in that direction. Now, obviously, we're not at the route. We're not as far down that route um, towards dictatorship as the Nazis were. But we are going, I said we're going slowly towards it, we're not now, we're going rapidly towards it. So the reason we have to stand up and convince people that 9-11 was in fact the inside job was to stop that kind of Nazification taking place, particularly in Britain and America. And the time to do it is not to think about it and worry about it and, re and, and think, well, I might be convinced by this if I read a bit more in a few years' time. The time to do it is now. Don't give them the benefit of the doubt. Because if we don't do it now, in four or five years' time, those... The apparatus of democracy will not be there for us to change our circumstances. So it's really either now or never. When you see Bush defend his Iraq policy, you will see that he does not use Iraq arguments in terms of closing the deal. When it comes to the heart of the matter, he uses 9-11 arguments. If, if he's asked, why did 2,000 people have to die in Iraq for no reason? The answer is 9-11, the lessons of 9-11, I know it's hard, but these are the lessons of 9-11.
With that kind of demagogy, he's able to keep a hard core of 30 to 35 percent of the American public. With 30 to 35 percent, he will be able to stay in office and wage war indefinitely. He'll be able to go for a wider war. He can manufacture new 9-11s to firm up that base. He and Cheney can provoke incidents that will lead to war with Iran, with Syria, with Venezuela, with North Korea. There's no limit to this. It, it, uh, it has no, no bounds. The only way to begin to attrit and to erode and to break up his 30 to 35 percent base is to begin dismantling the myth of, of September 11th. Because without accurate information, without an accurate understanding of the world, you cannot have a functional democracy. If people don't know what's going on, and if people don't understand what their leaders are doing, there's no democracy. This is the biggest problem, because as long as the American people are so uh, susceptible to propaganda through the television and the mass media, um, I really can't see how they will get themselves out of the predicament that they're in. Denial is, is, is actually, you know, it's, it's the default condition. We all live in it continually, and it takes a deliberate effort to stick your head up above that, uh, that state of denial and catch a breath of fresh air and really see what's going on. The world economy has had now 25 years of pretty un uninterrupted expansion. With a tremendous inflation of the financial sector, tremendous integration of the financial sector worldwide, tremendous consolidation within that integrating structure uh, uh, with, with fewer and fewer larger and larger institutions dominating, dominating the financial sector of the world economy. It's not too much of an exaggeration to, to say that, that the financial sector has probably never been so dominant uh, in at least a century. You'd have to go back to the late 19th century and what people remember as the robber barons of American capitalism, um, uh, the J.P. Morgans, the Vanderbilts, the Rockefellers, the Harrimans, uh, to to find a comparable historical period. And even that doesn't really fit because, because the sorts of incomes and the kind of wealth that their successors have today actually are far larger than they had. Um, one of the things that means in economic terms is that, is that, the, is that an increasing share of the total allocation of profits across the world economy is going into banks. And it's increasingly being recycled into financial investments as opposed to into real investments. And what a prolonged period like that implies uh, is an increasing um, um, attenuation of the real sector of the economy uh, and, and a concomitant shift in where jobs are and what are the dynamics driving uh, the behavior of the various national 
economies that are components. So to give you a concrete example, in the Anglo-American world, which dominates finance, industry, productive industry, metal bashing, fashioning things, uh, has declined as, as an economic activity. In the United States and Great Britain, this has meant a complete collapse in employment in those industries and a complete change in the nature of the tax base that the government depends on. It's not as stable as it once was. And what we call the increasing financialization of the economy, as opposed to just the increase of the financial sector. What I mean by financialization is that economic activity is in, on the part of ordinary people is increasingly devoted to shifting paper around and, and in basically speculating on real estate in those economies. Because we own our, generally the, the, the average American or British citizen owns his own home. And, and in consequence for the government, increasingly the uh, political objective of economic management is to make gross domestic product expand. And they do that by basically by manipulating real estate prices which increases the value of the collateral against which the banks can lend money to the people who, who nominally own the real estate. Um, this this is a, is, means a prof that these economies are profoundly different than they were 50 years ago. And, and in the case of the United States, to, to focus on the U.S., because it is at the center of, of the world monetary system, this has meant that America has to buy more and more and more from abroad that it used to make for itself. And uh, what that means concretely, for example, to give you a real-life example, is that New York City recently uh, has been in the market for, for bidders on a project to build a, commuter, a light commuter, commuter railway running in from Long Island to the city. They really need one. The old one is in, is in bad shape. And they can't find a manufacturer of a light railway system in, in North America. Well, not in the United States, at least. Bombardier in Canada probably would be a contender. But not in the United States. Yeah, the tar, tar sands are, are simply ordinary oil that has migrated to shallow depths at the edge of the geological basin. And it was weathered, uh, just weathered as it, it went there, attacked by bacteria, which took out the, the light fraction. So you're left with a sticky, tarry mess. There's a lot of this stuff there. Now, in the case of Canada, which is one of the main places, this stuff comes almost to the surface, but you have to dig out 70 meters, a maximum of 70 meters of overburden with shovels the size of this house. I mean, enormous shovels have to excavate this enormous hole in the ground to dig this tarry stuff up. They then have to centrifuge it, heat it, add caustic soda, or various treatments they have to do. And up till now, they've used stranded gas in Canada, little gas deposits, to fuel the mammoth plants that are taken to do this. And, and eventually, out of this whole process, which is really a mining process and a refining process combined, you can get synthetic oil. Perfectly good, perfectly reasonable. And so um, the resource is enormous, but if you, it's not homogenous. That's not always remembered. First of all, the depth to the stuff can vary. And, and you know, even if it got another 20 meters deeper, the cost of going 20, all this overburden is just huge. Also, in more details, the, the rock isn't quite the same, the oil is different from here and there. And so far, only the more favorable locations have been exploited. Um, so the constraint, the, the problem of, of this thing is, of course, you can, you can increase the production, no doubt, gradually. It's a huge investment, it's a huge project, um, and I think that production will rise into the future. On the other hand, if, if we do have an economic crash of some kind now, then the price of ordinary oil may collapse back down to $20 a barrel again. If demand falls, the price of oil will also fall, which in turn would make all of this stuff uneconomic again. And so I think in the minds of the investor community, this is, they're not quite ready to pour mountains of money into that thing uh, for fear that, well, this is a temporary thing now.
Uh, and it might, in terms of oil price, there might be a mini glut. Who knows? There might be a mini glut if demand collapses, because it's a very efficient market in a way. It overreacts to a small shortage and a small surplus. The, the, the reaction of the, the bankers is interesting. Um, and I don't know much about the banking world at all, personally. So I, I, I've now met several of them at these meetings and so on. And over lunch and drinks and so on, one, one begins to penetrate the way in which these people work. And, well, there's two, 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 uh, two elements to this to, to follow. First of all, the normal operation of the market. Now, uh, I, I find, I don't know how, how accurate this is, but what I conclude anyway is the way in which these fellows work is that uh, they have skill. By all means, they have skill. And the skill, and, they, and also they know precious little about what they actually invest in. I mean, you can't expect a banker to know the details of any kind of business in which he's investing. How could he? So, so if he, what he's doing really, his skill is to look around what his colleagues are doing. So they meet and they talk and they da 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 da, and it goes around the circle somehow. And I think how it really works is that they all sort of chatter in this way, and gradually a kind of consensus gels in the common feeling of which stock is the preferred one for June, let's say. So they sort of whisper and one says, to, I, I think it's Pepsi-Cola and the third one speaks to the fourth one and Coca-Cola, no, I think it's Pepsi. And gradually the word filters round and that, um, the skill is to, to suddenly catch, oh yes, it's going to be Pepsi for June, isn't it? So what they do then is they load up their own portfolios with Pepsi and those of their privileged clients but, of course, they're not supposed to be manipulating the market or insider trading or anything like that. So what do they do? They all publish their recommendations. It always seems strange that the bank would publish its recommendations, which you would think would be a closely guarded secret, but they publish it. And so if you look around all the different lists, and all the lists are different, but, surprise, surprise, everyone contains Pepsi. And then, once this is out, then they can go into the back room where they manage the post office workers' pension fund or something, and they say, well, Merrill Lynch is, uh, is proposing Pepsi and Goldman Sachs is doing it, and this one is doing it. I think we'll take a position, a small position, for the postman in, in Pepsi, shan't we? So that is done, and as a result, Pepsi goes up 2 or 3% on the month. The, uh, they then say, OK, let's sell out our own positions and work the next flavor of the month, whatever it is. So that seems to be how the system basically works. It's not exactly corrupt, it's not nothing evil about it, but in practice that is what it is, because they themselves have no basis for knowing whether Pepsi is better than any other kind of drink. Uh, so that's, that seems to be the general way in which they work. Now, in the face of this situation that we talk about, I have the impression that their main concern is to close ranks that uh, uh, they, 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 they're frightened of losing clients. So, so long as they're all more or less saying the same, then this flood of money that pours over them every day from all the institutional money still continues and nobody's got any particular reason to move from one to the other. So I think that all these meetings that I'm now being invited to our primary to and and it's one bank sort of lead bank calls in his 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 club so to speak, so that he is basically letting the others in his circle know this message. Now I have yet to hear how these people plan to react to it, and I don't think they really care in a way. So long as they're all in it together, it doesn't really matter if the market crashes or not, provided you know they're all saying the same. So I think this is quite important because. This message is now coming through to them as they make their advice, advice to their clients and they fix their portfolios and everything. Somewhere in all of this um, does appear this message. Uh, I think it's extremely difficult for them to make any sensible reaction because after all it's unprecedented. Nobody knows what to do. You see, in this whole funny world, if, if they say, well look, the airline business, Ryanair's going bust, uh, obviously. <laughs> 
Okay, fellas, we'll take a future position. We'll sell Ryan short, won't we? And they'll all do that. And they'll make money on Ryanair going bust, you know. I mean, you can work it up and you can work it down, provided you're, you know, it's all part of this sort of club they belong to. Yeah. And one thing they really hate is to be caught, caught left side, so to speak, you know. And that, one of these banker fellows sort of explained how it worked in this, in, in this, uh, well, apparently there's sort of three floors to simplify. There's the managers up on the top floor drinking coffee and making phone calls. And then on the second floor, there's the research department. And they're all making very serious studies of the banana crop of Ecuador or, or whatever it might be. And then on the ground floor are these fellows with the noses watching what each other do, the traders. And it seems that really the money is made by these traders who spot... Uh, the Argentine pesos going to hell, isn't it? And I move into something else and I sell this and I buy that and I do this and they make billions every hour just on their sort of nose. But this middle floor is really an insurance policy because if they get the thing badly wrong in some way, well, then the irate investor comes in and says, how come you lost me all my money? And they say, well, here, come to room number 304 and we've got here a huge study of the banana crop in... We studied everything possible. You can't ask us to do more than we did. So I would say, in part, their interest in covering this subject is to cover themselves so that they at least are able to take their clients when they've lost all their money to room number 600 and say, well, we did indeed study the oil position and here it is. So they look whiter than driven snow. And I think that's basic. And it is all about confidence. I mean, the whole money world has no real substance in, in this money thing. It's, a, it's an expression of confidence, or at least it's become. And it's interesting. I mean, uh, in earlier years, the Catholic Church regarded usury as a sin, you know, and I think the Muslims still do in some way. So uh, in, simpler, in simpler conditions, when people understood better where they lived, people could see there was something a bit dubious about this investment financial world. Well, this is one of the things as well. It's up to the American government to prove to us that their version of 9-11 is the correct one. Now, if this were going before a court of law, the jury would have to acquit the so-called conspirators because the evidence simply isn't there. On the one hand, we have the, the FBI and the American government telling us shortly after 9-11 they had no prior intelligence about this, and yet 48 hours later they claim to be able to name with great authority the 19 hijackers involved. Now I know from my work in counterterrorism that is simply impossible. Unless you were following people beforehand, and you, obviously then you could very quickly identify them, but they weren't doing that. And it doesn't appear that these names come from even the airline manifests, because the manifests that have been released do not have Arab names on them. So what we've got to ask is how did the FBI even come to the conclusion that these 19 people were involved, especially when we now have either, I've heard different figures and I've seen different research into this, but certainly a number of those 19 alleged hijackers have said that they are alive and well and working in places like Saudi Arabia. Now again, when the 9-11 Commission approaches this, it accepts the FBI information uncritically. It doesn't say to the FBI, how did you know this? What sort of investigation went on to establish this? And at the same time, it doesn't bother to even introduce the idea that some of these people might still be alive. And I, I would suggest that when a commission does not try to refute evidence that's well known in the public domain, it simply cannot refute that evidence and therefore ignores it. So the situation we're in is that there is very little evidence of al-Qaeda involvement. I mean, for what it's worth, bin Laden did reportedly shortly after the attack give an interview to a magazine in Pakistan called Umat, in which he said that it was un-Islamic to attack uh, innocent children and women and uh, civilians in general. I don't know if that's worth, it, worth anything, but I do mention that. And similarly, we've got to be very sceptical about some of these uh, videos that have been released through and so on that claim to be the words of bin Laden. They don't appear to be bin Laden at all. So I'm going to throw the question back to the Americans and say, prove to us that Al-Qaeda carried out this attack, because at the moment that evidence is simply not there. Well, I don't think, for example, that necessarily the head of the FBI, the head of the CIA and the American president were involved. I don't think it's that level of government involvement. But clearly, 
when you look at the run-up to 9-11, the amount of FBI investigations that were stopped by FBI HQ, for example, the fact that Mohammed Atta is allowed to enter America and leave freely, even though he's a known terrorist, would suggest to me there were people working within the wider American government who were actively allowing these terrorists, these patsies in fact, to be able to prepare for some kind of attack. And that's a clearly the cover story they could then use. They do have real terrorists in America they can blame the attack on. Um, but it goes further than that, obviously. I mean, all the associates of Bush uh, involved in the project for the New American Century, people like Pearl and Wolfowitz and so on, uh, are ultimately very rich people um, who uh, have controlling interests in, in industries that's, that's down to profit from this. And to believe that these people would think that, that 3,000 American deaths or 3,000 deaths in America was unacceptable, I don't think um, carries any weight at all. I think that they don't think like that at all. They think about their own wealth and they think about the fact that oil is allegedly um, about to peak and therefore America, which is more dependent on oil than any other society, needed to be able to control parts of the oil industry in the Middle East. And that's what uh, obviously happened as a result of 9-11 was that they could then uh, invade Iraq and take control of the Iraqi oil industry, but also crucially, of course, first invade Afghanistan and control the building of a unique um, pipeline across Afghanistan, which is what the Taliban didn't want. And, of course, these plans to invade Iraq and Afghanistan were, were a matter of public record before 9-11, but 9-11 was the catalyst that meant the American people would support those kind of initiatives. As the Project for the New American Century admits a year earlier in a, in a document called Rebuilding America's Defences, it, it says, absent a new Pearl Harbor, the American people will not support these kind of invasions in the Middle East. Yeah, I think we have to look long and hard at the mainstream media. Um, I've always been quite sceptical about the mainstream media because in general, you know, newspapers are funded through advertising uh, and therefore they are beholden to big business. Um, so on that level alone, we can't trust newspapers to objectively report the things. But in the particular case of 9-11, journalists who have tried to in, uh, challenge the official story have either been marginalised or been sacked or been persecuted in some way. People quickly learn that if you ask intelligent questions about a 9-11, you'll be on the wrong side of the authorities and they'll make your life very difficult. And America, of course, is supposed to be the land of free speech. And people who have tried to develop the stories of whistleblowers like Sybil Ed Edmonds, who talked about some kind of mole within the FBI's um, transcription department, um, have had injunctions slapped on them, which have been held, have been held up so f uh, upheld so far by the lower courts. And this is especially America, the land of free speech. You know, they've totally um, forgotten that their basic values of democracy. So it, it's not difficult to understand why the mainstream re media has realised it's much easier to keep your head down and not ask the difficult questions. Well, people who say, when people say, again, there's a conspiracy theory that there is a new world order. Well, George Bush Sr., after the first um, Iraq war uh, in 1991, got up and, and talked about this was good for the new world order. So, again, this is a matter of public record. Um, and I think that the new world order is just another name we're giving to this kind of collection of, of oil industry, arms industry. And, of course, the other one that, that we mentioned all the time, the pharmaceuticals industry. Um, and the project for the New American Century and, and big business in general. It, it's, it's kind of them protecting their interests. And the reason we are seeing these restrictions on our liberties is I do believe that the world is going to plunge into at least a recession, if not a depression. And of course, in those circumstances, people famously revolt. And that is why they are now introducing all this anti-terrorism legislation. Uh, they're proposing these ID databases. And what I believe eventually they'd like to do is chip everybody so they can stop that kind of rebellion um, by knowing where people are and controlling them essentially um, in times when you know people would be protesting. Especially since September the 11th 2001 um, with the collapse of the World Trade Center um, towers uh, a great deal is talked and said about the so-called war on terror. Um, I regard this as being a very unfortunate development, by which I mean the sort of the linguistic uh, um, creation of this idea of a war on terror. I don't like the idea of a war on anything. I think it's an absurd idea. I think war on poverty, war on drugs, it's all stupid.
very bad use of language, encourages us to do all the wrong kinds of things. And after all, what is war uh, in its essence other than violence? It's the use of violence to uh, get certain ends, usually property, and to control people and enslave people. And so I think the, the whole metaphor, the whole use of the word war is, is ghastly and mistaken. Um, and then, frankly, only seems to point to what a violent lot we are, unfortunately, or certainly what a violent lot we've become. So uh, um, you have this unfortunate notion of the war on terror. And I certainly think that one of the various ways that you could interpret this war, and I think it's a reasonable way to interpret it, is a kind of covert war for resources, particularly for petroleum resources. Um, and if you if you prepare to look at it uh, this way, and I'm afraid I think it's a rather twisted way of looking at the world, then it's it, it's it's rather clever, because you can talk about terror and scare people, and scaring people is a very good way of binding them together and making them do what you want. And this is an old technique, and and uh, Adolf Hitler and his uh, his terrible coterie used this technique on the German people and on others. Uh, with, with gruesome effectiveness, of course, as we've seen, and they of course stigmatize, they of course stigmatize uh, the poor Jewish people uh, and others too, and um, uh, uh, wipe them out in the millions. Um, and one of the reasons why this was done, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons why this was done was to galvanize the rest of the people. I mean, doubtless terrified them too, but it, it's a horrific technique, and I'm afraid the awful truth is that certainly it seems to work. And one of the things that the neoconservative policy uh, does, um, according to, uh, for, particularly according to its, its sort of founding father, if you like, which is this, uh, I think, appalling political philosopher, Leo Strauss. Um, one of the things that is done is to, is, is to concoct something, in this case, this war on terror, which then becomes a very useful device to scare everybody. You can pass all kinds of draconian laws. Um, you can do virtually whatever you like, actually, once you use this, and then you call people unpatriotic who disagree with it. It's a very old technique. Um, so this uh, war on terror, I think, can be seen as um, a neat cloak under which you can go about, uh, and especially in this so-called preemptive policy, go about attacking more or less whomsoever you please. And one has to note that there's nearly always some kind of resource connection, and it's most clear in the case of Iraq. Um, so I think it's fair to say that the war on terror is, is a, a covert war for resources. I am not saying that the only reason for the attack on Iraq was simply for oil. However, I think it was a very large factor. It may be that historians will be able to work out how large a factor it was. Maybe it was the largest factor. Maybe it was one of several factors. But it seems to me absurd to suggest that that effort would have been made on a country like Iraq if it didn't have vast oil reserves. Um, it just, it's just nonsensical. And it, it, it's a little bit of a mystery that so many people um, are, are prepared to just to, to, to accept that argument. And perhaps it's convenient. Um, I think some people, some of them, uh, accept it sincerely. I say it mystifies me. Um, but I think an increasing number of people, especially people outside of America, I don't think many people outside of America have much doubt that the, the attack on Iraq was principally motivated by oil and that um, less people perhaps have the attitude um, that, that the war on terror is a cloak for something else. But maybe it's more than we realize. Maybe it's more than we realize. And again, especially Europeans who, after all, saw the horror of, of the Second World War and, unfortunately, of the First World War too, where we, where we have a, a, perhaps a slightly different understanding, maybe we have a slightly deeper understanding, we certainly have deeper scars of it, I think, of, of, of seeing that what our political say, leaders say, what our industrial leaders say, is um, often not the truth, and possibly in certain cases um, never the truth. Um, I think that's I think that's one of the depressing uh, conclusions that one must draw throughout a fairly fairly long period of time. Uh, our so-called democratic leaders are not telling the truth. Um, they don't do the policies that they say they're going to do. Um, and I think one of the reasons of that is um, that they have many other agendas, including agendas for wanting to, to get their hands on resources, particularly petroleum, but not only that. 
and that they are also doing these things not for the people that voted for them, but uh, often against their uh, their their better, uh, but often against their uh, anything that will be beneficial to them, but in fact for the the greatest controlling powers in the world, which are um, global corporations. Well, the, the Project for a New America Century is a think tank. It's a very uh, pretty extreme right-wing think tank, and it drafted a document in September 2000 in the course of the presidential election campaign uh, for Bush, uh, which is called Strengthening America's Defences. And it makes very interesting reason, reading. It's pretty chilling. Um, it talks in regard to the Middle East uh, about how the flow of oil into the international markets uh, had been uh, interrupted by Saddam Hussein's regime uh, and that it was necessary to remove that and, if necessary, by military means. Don't forget this was written in September 2000. That is a year before 9-11 and three years before the Iraq war. Uh, it also says, very significantly, that even if Saddam Hussein were removed from the scene, it would still be necessary to take this action in the Middle East. So the American motive uh, is revealed by this not to be antagonism to Saddam Hussein, because uh, who, who we all know is a brutal, sadistic uh, tyrant, um, but it is not the human rights issues or the justice issues, it is the fact that he stood in the way of American control uh, over oil. He used it for his interests, not the Americans' interests, and that was not acceptable to the US. What the PNAC document also goes on to say is that we need to resist any country or group of countries for which read the EU or Japan challenging us, uh, challenging our leadership or our regional leadership. Uh, it talks about the need for American space forces um, because uh, the Americans supported the militarization of space and they wish to be in control of that. They talk about full spectrum dominance, in other words, uh, American control over every aspect uh, of military conflict, and one of those is control over the internet, so that there cannot be any uh, cybernetic uh, opposition uh, to U.S. interests. Uh, it talks about the need for more U.S. forces in Southeast Asia, and although it doesn't actually say the need for regime change in China, that would be going too far. The implication is that we need to exert more pressure uh, for the kind of change that we would like to see in that region. And indeed, even that has happened uh, because um, China, Russia, Iran uh, are all uh, at the moment uh, circled by American bases, or now 700 bases. Um, there are about a, uh, American bases across the world, and there are, I think, uh, something of the order of 135 countries out of 190 that now have American bases in them. That's about 70% of all the countries in the world. So we have seen this um, explosion of American power, physical control on the ground using every opportunity, unrest in the Caucasus, uh, the southern flank of uh, Soviet Russia, um, the so-called orange and tulip and other revolutions uh, occurring there, which is trying to get Western control of those countries to get the oil out of the Caspian. Um, so all of this has happened. Um, uh, which I think largely reflects what was always the policy of the Bush administration as revealed by this PNAC document. What it ends by saying, which I think is very, very interesting, is uh, that this, it says at the end of the document, is going to take a long time. I think you can underline those words, it's going to take a long time dash, absent, which is the American word for accept, except there is a catastrophic or catalyzing event like Pearl Harbor. I, I think uh, there are three things that are needed. 
First of all is we have to reduce uh, our use of oil, our use of fossil fuels, oil, coal and gas. Uh, secondly, we need much more uh, energy efficiency, that is the improved use of energy. And thirdly, the switch to renewable sources of energy, uh, solar, uh, biomass and wind, in particular tidal power as well. If you look at energy efficiency, the potential here is uh, very great because the waste of energy in our Western civilization is simply prodigious. Uh, one uh, way of uh, looking at this um, is the uh, amount of energy when you drive a car which actually reaches the wheels. It's only 15%. 85% doesn't actually drive the vehicle at all. Uh, if you look um, at uh, cooking food, <laughs> which families do uh, every single day across the world, uh, but with a standard oven in the Western civilization, less than a quarter of that heat and energy actually reaches uh, the food. And what I think is really just staggering, uh, if you look at US power stations, they discard heat, waste heat, which is sufficient to power the entire Japanese economy. The waste of energy is absolutely prodigious. And it has been calculated that if uh, there was an improvement uh, of something like three miles per gallon efficiency in fuel economy in US cars and light vehicles, that would be enough for the US to forego oil imports from the Gulf, which you might have thought was a rather better way of solving the problem than launching an unprovoked and illegal war against Iraq. And even if we were to improve by something like 3% a year uh, in energy intensity, that would be enough, it has been calculated by the end of this century, to achieve the same amount of utilization of power as we have today at one quarter of the availability of energy. So the, the potential for greater use of energy is absolutely enormous. And if people turn around, governments or individuals or industry, and say, well, this is a terrible problem, what can we do about it? The answer is that there is an enormous amount that we can do about it. In terms of the use of petrol or diesel or gasoline in cars and planes, uh, in terms of greater efficiency in energy and industry, I mean, Britain, we have a climate change levy, which is designed to make industry utilize its energy more efficiently. Um, and of course, individuals, you and I, are able to do so much. We can insulate our houses better. Uh, we can consider the use of the car more efficiently. Uh, don't forget that one eighth of all car journeys are less than a mile. Half of all car journeys in the West are less than two miles. Uh, it would be better for us um, either to walk, that's probably the best thing, or to cycle or go on public transport. We don't have to use a car. Um, and of course, many of the devices and household equipment that we have around the house is, again, very wasteful of energy. And all of this can be improved. And it would be better for us. It'll cost us less. It'll help our wallet or our purse. And it'll be better for the environment. And it'll reduce uh, the amount of scarce energy that we consume. So it's a win-win-win situation. So for goodness sake, why don't we do it? Yeah, I mean, the, the problem is, is that there really are some very fundamental questions to be raised about what happened on, on, on in, you know, on 7-7. Seven seven. Um, and they range across a whole host of things on a, on a simple basic level of an intelligence failure, which I guess would be the basic focus of an inquiry, which is why we failed to, 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 to anticipate this attack. Surely, you know, for a government that is interested in security, the first thing you'd want to do is to understand why we failed. And then you can introduce legislation, or then you can think about measures of improving our intelligence system and so on and so forth.
But to just rush through with this draconian deterrence legislation really seems to me to be disingenuous. Um, and looking at the evidence that has come out in the public record about the, about the kind of advance warning that was available, it does suggest that we did have a fairly precise indication of what was going to happen. And that does raise questions about why we did fail to act. A number of reports you know, in the public record, mainstream sources, say that Israeli intelligence, Saudi intelligence and French intelligence, at the very least, all gave warnings of an imminent attack on London. Um, a number of them were specific. The Saudis said that there was going to be an attack on the London underground. They even indicated a date that it would be in July. Now, why was that not acted on? No questions have been enough, have been asked. You know, and surely an inquiry would, would look into what was done with this information. There's other bits of information that, that indicate that even the bombers themselves, the alleged bombers, were being monitored prior to, to, to London bombings. According to the official kind of narrative, we've been told that they didn't know anything about them at all, and so on and so forth. Then the other day, there was an article in, in, in the Mirror, the London Mirror, which basically said that for all four of the bombers, we know that at least one of them was apparently being monitored, um, but then was not considered a threat according to security services. But now we know that all four of them, according to a defence official, anonymously talking to the Mirror, were monitored prior to the attacks for about a year or so, but then, according to this story, were, were not considered a threat and then, then say they didn't continue the surveillance. But again, you see the shifting of the story from one person being monitored, but none of them, are, no one else monitored, then, well, actually four were monitored. Again, it has parallels to precisely what happened after 9-11, where we had shifting stories about the hijackers, shifting stories about what happened in, in regard to the planes, First, officials said that there were that no planes were were scrambled to to again to, to intercept the, these jets flying around in the skies on 9/11 until after the Pentagon was hit. Then officials said that no, actually we did scramble planes. Then they tried to construct it. No, I tried to release a timeline. This very similar pattern is happening here, um, and it really makes clear that at every step of the way, somebody's lying. First, you're lying about one thing, then you're omitting something. You're lying about another. And there was an interesting statement by, from the French interior minister uh, a few weeks after 7-7 about the, the surveillance of the alleged bombers. He said that um, after a briefing that had been given by the Home Secretary, Charles Clark, to all the EU ministers, he came out of this briefing and he gave a public statement and he said, well, you know, it seems as if that we had been monitoring this group for a long time um, and essentially we had arrested them and released them previous released them for intelligence interest because we wanted to continue surveillance um, and after he said this the uh, home secretary basically came out and said absolute bunkum this is complete rubbish you know i don't know where he's getting this from you know and i really respect him but this is not true suddenly the french interior minister kind of did an about turn and said no no i didn't say that i didn't say that but then in the, in a further clarification with one with one uh, uh, press agency, I can't remember which one, he said that, actually, I didn't say that it was the bombers themselves who were arrested, but I did say that the network that they were associated with was being su was under surveillance, and several members of that network were being monitored, and they were arrested, and they were released not because they weren't considered a threat, but because they were considered a threat, and we wanted to mo we wanted to monitor them and find out what was going on and just keep a tab on them. This was a really fundamentally different story to what the British uh, intelligence officials have been telling us. Um, and it seems clear that, again, that the, the holes in the official story are, are really clear. So, yes, we do need an investigation. And it seems to me that, that the evidence, that the, the, the prima facie case, that the government had some, some kind of dubious relation to the attacks, they failed to act, um, either through sheer absolute criminal negligence or through something far worse, is... is almost a foregone conclusion. Um, the, guess, the, the role of an inquiry is to establish how far this went. Why haven't the governments really understood peak oil and started to respond to it? I think there are a lot of reasons. Uh, certain levels of government, I think there is understanding. Uh, certainly the CIA understands peak oil. But the elected politicians are mostly in the dark, and I think there are a number of reasons for that. One is that all the incentives are wrong. Uh, 
uh, if you're a politician, either you want to tell the people good news or you want to tell them bad news that you can blame on your opponents. Peak oil doesn't fit in either of those categories. Uh, and then politicians are getting some very bad information. Uh, you know, our, our understanding just of how much oil is there and how much is being produced is not good information. Uh, the uh, countries of OPEC have cooked the books on their reserves, and this is even being admitted now by the International Energy Agency. Back in the late 1980s, they, they revised all of their so-called proven reserve figures by 50 to 300 uh, percent. Every country did this. Is all of that oil there? Almost certainly not. You know, there is no international agency that actually goes around to the oil producing countries and determines what their reserves actually are on the basis of real evidence. Saudi Arabia's actual oil reserves are a state secret. So uh, politicians do not have good information and they're not advised well because uh, many of the energy agencies around the world, like the U.S. Department of Energy, really uh, just accept these uh, these reserve figures at face value and uh, and they they don't make any effort to get underneath the surface and see what the real situation is. They've never successfully predicted the U.S. oil production peak or the oil production peak of any other country and and so we're in effect flying blind. The only people who are really on this subject are the, the few independent analysts uh, like Colin Campbell, Jean La uh Ken DeFaze, you know, we could name, you know, a dozen, two dozen people who are oil experts who spent their lives in the industry and who are retired or are, are not currently employed by the industry and are able to speak out. And, uh, you know, these are not people that the governments listen to. Well, I, I personally am convinced that the 2004 election was uh, ridden with, with fraud and that Kerry was, was likely the, the actual victor in, in that election. Of course, there was tremendous fraud in the in state of Ohio, and this has been thoroughly documented. Um, there, the, um, the election was run by the Secretary of State of Ohio, who also happened to be the, uh, the George W. Bush uh, campaign supervisor for that state. Um, and so as a consequence of that, the districts that were traditionally Republican were supplied with all of the latest uh, voting equipment and, and so on, whereas the, the precincts that traditionally vote Democratic didn't have enough voting machines or voting equipment, and so there were long lines, in some cases six, seven, eight hour lines, people standing in line waiting to vote and of course, you know, people work for a living, and uh, and many many thousands of people couldn't afford simply to stand in line all day. Uh, and this is only one example of the of the kinds of irregular irregularities that have been documented in that state. And of course, there are many other states also where extreme voting irregularities were were documented, including uh, Florida and New Mexico, on and on. Uh, if you add all of these together, it's it's entirely possible that Kerry actually won by by several percentage points, perhaps three or four percent. Uh, that's what the exit polls show, and the exit polls in elections are traditionally very very accurate. Uh, the commentators really bent over backwards to explain away why the election polls were wrong in this particular case. Uh, they certainly weren't wrong in uh, in the country of Georgia when when that country had contested elections and historically it's it's impossible to point to any other historic instance where election polls have been wrong but but in this particular case we're told uh, the the exit polls were were incorrect that simply doesn't make any sense Actually, I don't think the, uh, the, the giant multinational corporations are very well prepared for peak oil. And I think they're going to suffer just as everybody else is. Uh, exactly how that will work out, I have no idea. But think of all of the corporations that depend on a daily basis uh, for cheap transportation of either 
raw materials or manufactured goods. It's hard to think of a, a, a business that doesn't. Think about Walmart uh, and how it depends on cheap manufactured products flown in from China or shipped in from China on a daily basis. I think Walmart is, you know, is going to be hammered by peak oil. Uh, and that's true almost all the way up and down the line. Uh, so, you know, peak oil is not going to be good for very many people, in fact. It's going to be a disaster for our entire industrial way of life. Okay. Does that mean, will we see the end of capitalism? Yeah, I think, in effect, we will see the end of capitalism as a result of, of peak oil. And the reason I say that is that capitalism really is a set of institutions uh, that grew up during the past few centuries, which was a time of expansion. During the past few centuries, of course, we had the, the European invasion of the rest of the world that brought in lots of, of cheap resources, in, including uh, you know, everything from gold and silver to timber to pelts. You know. And then we had the Industrial Revolution, which meant lots of cheap energy from coal and uh, oil and natural gas. And so we had economic growth year after year, fueled by all of these resources and, and energy. Now, peak oil means we're getting to the end of, of growth. And I don't think capitalism can function without growth. Capitalism is going to collapse. Now, what succeeds capitalism, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not a Marxist. I don't think that, uh, you know, we'll see a resurgence of uh, Soviet-style, you know, planned economies, because those haven't, haven't functioned very well either. And actually, those function on the basis of the assumption of continual growth as well. So what we'll have to replace capitalism, I really have no idea. I think we may have a reversion to a uh, more of a uh, localized, barter-based uh, economy um, where much less economic activity is occurring. And the success of those local economies, I think, will depend upon uh, the ability of, of people in, in regions, in, in areas, to begin to uh, work together cooperatively to develop those those local economies. I mean, where people fail to do that, I think there could be a reversion to a sort of medieval, uh, feudal kind of political economic system that really wouldn't uh, wouldn't be very good for anyone. The second attack, I guess, is the one that's captured on, on news film because he's in the middle of a photo opportunity reading to these uh, or listening to these children read uh, My Pet Goat mm -hmm. in the uh, elementary school class in Sarasota, mm -hmm. Florida. Yeah. My personal analysis of this is that he is frozen in fear, terror, and panic. He does not know what to do. And he sits there waiting for somebody to tell him what it is he must do. He is not an active president. He doesn't call for telephones. He doesn't issue a parade of crisp orders. He doesn't say, scramble every fighter, bring down all planes, close the borders, go to red alert. Nothing of the kind. He sits there, and we know that his press secretary, Ari Fleischer, is in the back of the room holding up a big placard saying, don't say anything. Don't comment. Um, this is obviously not a president. This is a puppet. This is a figurehead. This is a ceremonial figure, if you like. That is how Bush tried to explain his behavior to the 9-11 Commission when he was interviewed. Of course, he had to, he had to be interviewed together with Cheney. The, the reports are that he was sitting on Cheney's lap while he gave this interview. And there are other reports that Cheney was sitting on, the wi on his wife's lap uh, because that's how he has to appear. Cheney can't appear without his wife, and Bush can't appear without Cheney. So Bush said, I sat there and tried to project calm and strength. Now this is a, an absurdity that is verging on, on pandemonium of insanity. Uh, he simply doesn't know what to do. He's got to be told what to do. There's the other dimension, is that as, as you read, for example, in my book, 9-11 uh, Synthetic Terror, Made in USA, I devote a whole chapter to Bush's behavior and movements on this day, because I consider it to be of critical importance. Uh, a Secret Service agent 
hearing the news of either the first or the second plane hitting the buildings in Manhattan said, we're out of here. That was standard operating procedure. The standard operating procedure is, is if a major terror event is in progress, the president has to be taken to a secure location. Uh, we know, for example, Cheney, obviously considered much more important, was literally picked up and carried from his office in the White House down into the bunker in the in the sub sub basement, where, where he would probably be safe from a from a direct air, air airplane impact, maybe. But in the case of Bush, despite the fact that one Secret Service agent says we're out of here, they don't move him. He stays there. Somehow that impulse is overridden. The standard operating procedure is abandoned, and Bush is essentially left there as a sitting duck. I don't believe reports of conspiracy theorists who say, well, they let him stay there because they were all in on it. They all knew everything that was happening. The invisible government, the coup faction or putsch faction behind 9-11 is in the federal government, but they don't issue engraved invitations to their terrorist actions. They confront somebody like Bush with a fait accompli, and we'll get into that perhaps in a second, but they left him there as a very inviting target. There's good research by Daniel Hopsicker that there had been something resembling an assassination attempt against Bush in the morning. A camera crew showed up at Bush's hotel in Longboat Key in Florida on the morning of 9-11 at seven, six or seven o'clock in the morning, and they said, we're here to do an interview. The Secret Service allegedly said, we don't know anything about that interview, go away. The guess might be that uh, it might be a Maksud operation. In other words, Maksud uh, was uh, a leader of the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan. He had been assassinated several days before by a camera crew of suicide bombers who came in, and instead of having a camera, as we do here, I hope, they had an exploding bomb that killed all of them, but killed Maksud as well. Um, I would ascribe that to the CIA rather than to uh, rather than to anybody else, because they needed, they, they didn't want a nationalist like Maksud uh, running the Northern Alliance. He would have been too difficult to handle. He was somebody who had stood up to the Soviets. He wouldn't hesitate to stand up to the, to the punks from the CIA and, and, and the U.S. forces. So assassination attempt in the morning, hung out to dry, essentially left there, security stripped in the morning. Then Air Force One takes off. No fighter escorts are there. And there's also a tremendous reluctance on the part of the pilot of Air Force One to tell the Air Force where he's going. The reports are that a couple of fighter jets finally appear, but they're simply told, follow Air Force One. We're not telling you where we're going. Doesn't really indicate too much trust in the military. Indicates rather that the people in Air Force One knew that they were in the midst of a military coup and that Bush might become expendable at any point in the day. And then above all, the centerpiece of 9-11, I think the single most important piece of evidence in the entire day, the incoming threat given to the Secret Service, Angel is next, meaning we will destroy Air Force One. And it doesn't just come with Angel is next, it then comes with a train of cosmic level code words, top secret code words, indicating that behind that threat is a network that has access to the most important secrets of a whole range of executive departments, presumably CIA, National Security Agency, Pentagon, FBI, Justice, Treasury even, the whole array. And that's a threat. The idea is, what they're saying to Bush is, you've got to go on television and start saying, Bin Laden, Bin Laden, Bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, 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 and you will remain in office. If you don't, you may be liquidated at any time. You may not see the end of this day. I think some, to some degree, what's most interesting about 9-11 are the things that almost happened but didn't. What happened, of course, was a terrific tragedy, but the things that might have happened were even worse. The other thing the invisible government wanted uh, Bush to do, this coup faction, if you will, was to get on the phone with Putin and tell him we are seizing Afghanistan now, and we're going to set up bases in your soft underbelly in the former Soviet republics 
of Central Asia. Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzia for starters, after that perhaps Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, uh, and the rest. Uh, that is a very dangerous move. Uh, that might have been uh, responded to by Putin with his own threats. He might have said no. So the invisible government had to have the possibility of nuclear escalation, and they did. They had it in two ways that we know of. One is that in the Angela's next phone call, they had code words that seemed to indicate that they had access to the nuclear launch codes, that they were able to somehow access the so-called football, the collection, the briefcases that are filled with these codes that accompany the president but are also kept in other places for use in case of all-out nuclear war. So the, the perpetrators of 9-11, the coup faction inside the U.S. government, have these codes. They can launch nuclear war that way. There's another way they could have launched it through an exercise called Global Guardian, because it just so happened that on the morning of 9-11 there was also an exercise simulating all-out thermonuclear war. And part of that exercise appears to have been an attempt as a part of the drill, as a part of the simulation, for a rogue faction to gain access to command and control systems that would give them the ability to launch missiles. So that might be the concrete, specific back door that the invisible government might have used in order to uh, escalate in the nuclear realm if that had become necessary. Essentially, the ultimatum to Bush is either you launch the war of civilizations against the Arabs and the Islamic world in Afghanistan, later in Iraq, you launch it in conventional form, or we will launch it ourselves in nuclear form. In other words, we can incinerate Cairo, Damascus, Tehran, uh, you name it, Kabul, all of those places can be hit by missiles within minutes. We'll do that and leave you to deal with the consequences. Now, of course, one of the overtones of this, and I'm, I'm relying here on, just in terms of the sources, the Réseau Voltaire, presumably having the benefit of the French intelligence services. Secondly, Debka, a website that is close, I believe, to the views of the Israeli Mossad, and then another one called Namakon, which is a group of KGB Soviet intelligence veterans. They seem to converge on this hypothesis, that uh, there was a nuclear option built into it. And uh, the only, they, essentially it's an ultimatum telling Bush that the only way you can remain in office is if you begin to preach the war of civilizations and uh, and act in the way that we are we are demanding. There's also reports through the Rachel Voltaire in particular that Tony Blair was on the phone actively with Bush, telling him you've got to go on television and say Al Qaeda bin Laden. And of course, for that there was absolutely no proof. There was no scrap of proof in the world that that bin Laden, Al Qaeda had anything to do with this. Uh, and indeed, uh, the, the FBI has admitted that in going into Afghanistan, they never found anything, not one line, not one scrap that would have anything to do with the events uh, of 9-11. So I think the, the um, scratching the surface on 9-11, what is revealed is a horror that is much greater than even the one that we saw.